I accumulated seven pilot ratings in three months and one day. If you're a guy in your late 40s or early 50s and you're dreaming about becoming a professional airline pilot because you're no longer fulfilled or happy by whatever it is you're doing now, I've got some pretty incredible news for you. First off, you're not too late. And as you're gonna see in this video, I'm literally living proof that you can rapidly accumulate all the pilot certifications that you need to make all of this happen to go from where you are now to airline pilot in less than a year and a half. So before we dive into that, let me explain a little bit. So back on April 21st of this year, I published a video that explained what at the time was a plan to get from, we'll call it zero, I had a private pilot's license, to airline pilot in as little as 18 months, starting at age 53. And much to my surprise, that video was viewed about 115,000 times over about a two week period. And things went a little crazy. Well, I've got good news now, it's not just a plan. I've actually completed all of my flight training in the last three months. And in this video, I wanna provide you with an update on what is possible in terms of accelerated training, how fast you can get all the ratings, what it all costs, and probably less than you think, and maybe most importantly, what to watch out for so that you don't make the same mistakes that a lot of other would-be pilots that I spoke to made that really seriously slowed down their process. So if all of that sounds good to you, stick with me because I'm gonna unpack it all in this video and we're gonna dive right into it. Ready to go? Let's do it. All right, so in case you have not seen any videos from me before, um, I do wanna make you aware that uh, somewhere up on the screen, there's gonna be a link to a video that I recorded about is, is 53 too old to become an airline pilot? Short answer is no, it's not. There's a lot more detail in the video. If you wanna watch it, make sure you click that link. Second of all, if you've been not following aviation closely and you're maybe you're not aware that now is probably the very best time in history to become a pilot. And that's really for uh, a couple of key reasons. Number one is demographics. There's huge waves of pilots retiring. If you Google the phrase pilot retirement tsunami, I believe it is, it'll take you to a number of articles. The other thing that exacerbated the pilot shortage that we have now is COVID. They bought out or a lot of pilots retired early when COVID happened. And then of course, when COVID came to an end and travel surged, there's a, a big void left. And as a result of that, and this is the part that caught my interest, the airlines are literally the first time in history have had to seriously pony up. As an example, United just about a week or two ago signed a new contract with their pilots union where the pilots got a 40% increase in pay. In other words, when you get to an airline, in my case, I'll be a first officer at probably SkyWest Airlines, I'll be able to make six figures in year one, which never before in the history of aviation could you make that kind of money as a low time first officer. And then the other thing that we're gonna go into detail in this video is just, I wanna give you a breakdown of the costs, how much everything, uh, doing the approach that I did, how much it all costs. The good news is it's going to be much less than you think. I did a video earlier on outlining the budget and a lot of people that watch that video, they're like, Trent, you're dreaming. You'll never get it done for that amount of money and I proved them all wrong. I actually came in under budget using the approach that I'm gonna share with you in this video. So let's talk about what I was able to accomplish over the last 90 days. So I started, I drove out to a school and on May 5th of this year, I started my training. I completed my training approximately 93 months and one day later on August the 6th. Now I started off with a private pilot's license that I earned in Canada way back in the 90s and I had about 100 hours. And when I got to the school, much to my chagrin, we figured out that the cross country legs were one mile short of what the FAA requires. So that meant I didn't have a license that I could convert to an FAA license. So I didn't have to refly the whole 100 hours, but I had to fly all those cross country hours. And of course, now I had to study all the ground school stuff, which took me about two weeks to get ready. 
Um, so I was able to earn my private, my FAA private license by May 29th. And so I have, just in case people are making all this up here. So this is the temporary airman's certificate. That was May 29th. I got my instrument rating on June 20th. I got my commercial pilot's license. These are all my temporary airman certificates, as I mentioned, on July 10th. I got my certified flight instructor. I think that's what it says on this one. On July 25th, I got my multi-engine rating on July 28th. I got my CFII on August the 3rd. Actually, I think the student pilot was the first one I showed. So I'm one certificate out of whack, but you get the idea. We'll get them put on the screen. Um, so August 3rd, I got my CFI. And then on August 6th, I got my multi-engine instructor rating. So I accumulated seven pilot ratings in three months and one day. And as far as I'm aware, that may be a record. I, I don't know of anyone who's done it faster. The people that owned the school were kind of jaw struck or, or jaw slack, whatever the right expression is, because they're like, darn, dude, you really hauled ass through that. And the reason that I did that, I want to make it absolutely clear. I was doing this on a, I, I literally put my life on hold for 91 days. I did nothing but fly and study and fly and study. I was doing multiple flights per day. And when I wasn't in the cockpit, I was studying, 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 studying. I was fortunate. I was living in my fifth wheel. My wife and child came out. They handled grocery shopping. They handled laundry. They handled anything that I needed to support me. And I realized that not everybody can do that, but there are a number of people who can do that because you're at a stage later in life when you maybe have the financial wherewithal to literally hit the pause button on absolutely everything in your life to focus on just flying. Now, if you're not in a position to do that, then of course you'll have to say, well, whatever Trent was able to accomplish in three months plus one day, maybe I need five months for, or maybe I need six months for. Obviously I can't speak to that in this particular video, so I'll, I'll let you do that math all on your own. And again, reminder, I had already banked about a hundred hours with my Canadian private pilot's license. So don't be roasting me in the comments saying that I cheated or took a shortcut or didn't disclose that to you. I had those hundred hours now I was flying, I was logging about 25 hours a week. So if I had to do those 100 hours, if, if I didn't have them, you'd add about six weeks to my timeline. So selfishly speaking, one of the really cool things uh, about what I was able to accomplish was early on when I put that plan up there, there was a lot of people that had pretty harsh comments that it was impossible and I was dreaming and you're, I was a goofball and a nut job and I was never gonna get it done. So I want to share with you, if you decide to try and do this on your own, don't listen to those people. Those people are the armchair quarterbacks of the aviation world who are too chicken to go after their dreams and too chicken to commit to their dreams. And if you wanna make this happen, you can't be one of those people. You have to be the type of person that goes out and takes action and is willing to put your life on hold. And if you're willing to do that and you choose the right type of school, and I'm going to explain that to you in this video, there is absolutely no reason why you can't accomplish what I was able to accomplish. So let's talk, I learned a lot during this process. I actually had lunch today with one of the guys who happens to live in my market who saw that YouTube video and he was really keen to have lunch with me because he had a lot of questions. And so I wanna share with you what I learned in the hopes that I will be able to help you to avoid making mistakes that cost you time and cost you money and generate high levels of frustration, which obviously nobody wants to do. So number one, get your first class medical first. Don't bother and do anything until you get your first class medical, because if you can't get a first class medical, you will not become an airline pilot and or a cargo pilot because you must have that. So, and that that's a one day deal, go get it done. So then the next thing you're gonna do is you need to write or take, what we, in Canada we say we write an exam, but here in the US we say we take an exam or took an exam. So bear with me as I repeatedly say, write an exam. So what I did, and I produced a separate video on this and I'll, there'll be a link somewhere around here to get to that video that explains my study plan. But essentially I took, see, I almost said it again. 
I took all the FAA written exams before I went to flight school. So you could get literally get started on that. And I have a whole nother video that explains how I studied and the systems and software that I used and so forth. But essentially, I think I wrote four FAA, wrote, see there, I did it again, took four FAA written exams in a period of about three weeks. So make sure that if you're gonna do what I did before you go and do any accelerated flight training, get those exams written because there will not be enough time in the day if you're trying to go at the, at the pace that I went at to be able to do flying, uh, preparing to take the written exams and preparing for the ground school. There's not enough hours in the day. So let's talk now a little bit about accelerated training. There are some people who have chosen to comment on my videos who think that because I trained faster, I'm somehow inferior in my level of knowledge and they're just looking at it wrong. And I want to make sure that you understand this. Going faster, it's not worse. It doesn't mean that you're not trained as well. It just means that you're flying and studying every day instead of one to two days per week, where most people who are doing this while they've got a job, they can't do it all day every day. And so they're not thinking about flying on the other five days of the week. They're only thinking about flying when they're flying, or maybe they're doing a little bit of homework. So that's the approach that most part-time people take. Most people train that way. Know in advance that just because it's accelerated doesn't mean it's inferior. As a matter of fact, by going faster, I actually forgot less. Because when you're super immersed in something in the study of aviation, like I was, the knowledge just keeps compounding. As you're going through all these ratings and all these check rides, you know, like all of them are gonna ask you about weather and all of them are gonna ask you about systems and all of them are gonna ask you about aeronautical decision-making and all of them are gonna ask you about aerodynamics and, and a bunch of other topics. Well, guess what? If you're going faster, you didn't forget it all between check rides and oral exams, which means that you didn't have to restudy it over again. So um, there's, in my opinion, there's absolutely nothing wrong with going at a very accelerated rate. As a matter of fact, I think it's better. The other thing that it's important for you to understand is the difference between a part 61 school, which I attended, and a part 141 school. Now I'll let you Google the difference between those two schools, but the conclusion is you can go a whole lot faster at a part 61 school than you can at a part 41 school. So when you're selecting whatever school you're gonna go to, do not choose a part 141 school if you're in a hurry. So now we've narrowed it down to, okay, I'm gonna to go to a part 61 school. Are all schools created equal? Hell no, they are not. There are three key ingredients that your school must have for you to be able to train at an accelerated rate. And sidebar, by the way, I will be offering accelerated training in Boise now that I'm a certified flight instructor and I got all these ratings. So if you wanna train with me, you can absolutely do that. You would have to come to Boise. So what are these three ingredients? Well, number one, airplanes. School's gotta have enough airplanes relative to the amount of students that they have because those airplanes require maintenance. And if the planes go down for maintenance, obviously you can't fly them. So pay very special attention to the student to plane ratio. Now the school is gonna tell you because they want you to sign up. Oh yeah, we got enough, we got enough. What you need to do is hang out in their lobby or in their parking lot, ideally, and then go and talk to people who were walking out of that building and say, hey man, I got a question for you. Are you a student here? Yes, I am. How available are the aircraft to you? Oh, you know, I can only get one plane. I can only book a flight like every four days. <clears throat> you don't wanna to go to that school because you're simply not going to be able to go fast enough. What you're looking for is people saying, yeah, I get to fly pretty much every day, weather permitting. Now, what's the second thing? On-site mechanics. If the school does not have their own mechanical department, that might present an issue depending upon, you know, how backlogged the 
aviation services facilities are that that school relies on to do their 100 hour inspections and their plane maintenance. So make sure you ask about that stuff. Ideally, they've got on-site mechanics, they're working on their own planes, they can turn them around real quick so you're almost never without a plane because it's down for maintenance. And then finally, and this one is the big kicker because there's a shortage of these guys around North America, DPEs, Designated Pilot Examiners. The way this works is your instructors train you and then they sign you off. They endorse you to say you are now ready for a check ride. What I know is a huge problem all around North America is, okay, I'm ready for a check ride and you can't get a DPE to give you a check ride for a month or two months or three months, etc. You need to make sure that whatever school you choose has sufficient access to the DPEs so that you're not waiting, killing time and getting rusty and forgetting everything that you just practiced while you're waiting for that DPE to be available. I don't think a lot of people think about asking that question. And again, schools are gonna say, oh yeah, we got lots of DPEs. What I would suggest you do is you hang out in the parking lot and you talk to the students and you say, hey, how long do you wait for check rides? Because that is going to be critical. In my case, I almost did not have to wait for check rides at all. Occasionally, there was weather issues. Once in a blue moon, there was an airplane issue. But for me, I don't think I ever waited longer than two or maybe three days to get the check ride. And that was a critical, critical piece to how I was able to go as fast as I did. All right, let's talk about the money because everybody wants to know how much did it cost? So I budgeted $50,000 to do this and I came in under budget. I'm going to break it down for you in a second. To put this in perspective, you may have heard of a school called ATP. They're a nationwide school. They advertise that they can get you, I think, to commercial pilot or maybe your first CFI in five months. I don't think that includes getting a multi-rating. I don't think it includes getting a, a CFII, which is Certified Flight Instructor for Instruments. And I don't think it includes being an MEI, a multi-engine instructor. So they're charging somewhere in the neighborhood, I believe, of $92,000. And you don't get all that extra stuff. You could end up spending a significant amount more if you choose one of these all national premium price schools. And many people do that, especially the younger fellows, because they're using a student loan. So they're not so much thinking about the whole cost. But if you're a, a later in life dude like me and you got a little bit of money like I did, maybe you don't need a loan then the price becomes really, really important. My actual flight training cost, so of this 46,000 that I spent, 6,000 of it was on check rides. And I don't know whether ATP includes the cost of check rides in their 92,000 or whatever the number is. There was some other training related stuff and I don't know even what this was. My wife was the one in charge of the books. It was 3,200 bucks. And then on actual renting aircraft and paying for instructors, I spent just $37,000. I'll put a link to uh, another video that I have that talked about my budget in detail. If you're curious to watch that, please do. But just know that you don't have to spend anywhere near as much as a lot of people say that you need to spend. So in my case, here's how kind of it broke down. My, my MEI cost me about 5,500 bucks. My CFII cost me about four grand. My CFI cost me about eight grand. My multi-engine rating cost me about 5,500. And the rest was amortized over the commercial rating, the instrument rating, and the little bit of the private pilot license that I had to do over again. When I originally came out with that video that I said, hey, here's my $50,000 budget. Again, the comments were filled with people saying, basically, you're an idiot, you're on crack, you're a nut job, you're a looney tune, you'll never be able to do this. It costs way more than that. And I'm very happy to say that I was able to prove all of those people wrong. It does not have to cost more than that. Now, caveat, I learned things quickly. Maybe you need more hours than I do. I did everything in the bare minimum amount of time. And as you know, in the world of aviation, more time means more money. So if you're not one who maybe learns as quickly as other folks, then you should expect to spend more money because you're going to need more time in the aircraft or more time in the simulator. 
And speaking of simulators, the one hack that I want, it's a cost saver, significant cost saver that I wanna make sure you understand is the FAA allows you for your instrument rating, I believe it's 20 hours. And then for your commercial, it's another 30 hours because I have 50 hours of simulator time. That's a lot less expensive than going and flying around in a real airplane. So make sure that you use every hour of simulator time, which means you need to choose a school that has a simulator. So I guess that would be the fourth item that I really should have listed earlier in order for you to take advantage of the ability to, to save all of that money. All right, we're at a point in the video now where I've kind of brought you up to speed on the first part of the journey, which is getting all of the certifications and training necessary to now be a professional pilot, but I can't be an airline pilot yet because I don't have 1500 hours yet. I've only got about 300 hours. So the common question is, well, hey man, what are you gonna do? The most common path to go from where I'm at to 1500 hours is you use all those instructor ratings that you got and you go be a flight instructor. Now in this regard, there's again, a great deal of uh, misunderstandings of what is possible, how fast you can accumulate that time as a flight instructor. Now, obviously this depends on where you live because some places have way better weather for flying. I happen to live in Boise, Idaho, where we get 300 days of sunshine a year. So we can fly all year round. We don't get a lot of thunderstorms. We don't get a lot of fog or low clouds or low ceilings. So there's a lot of good flying here. You might not live in a place that does that. So you need to take that into account. My mentor, whose, whose path I have been following to the letter for my entire journey, he was an independent flight instructor here in Boise. And over the period of time that he did that, he was able to average 125 hours per month. I see no reason to believe, like for example, the school, the main school here has a one year waiting list. So the demand for flight instruction vastly outstrips the supply of flight instruction. So as an independent, I see no reason to think that I will not be able to rack up 125 hours a month. Now I'm gonna work six days a week to do that. I'm only gonna take one day off a week to spend with my family because I wanna go quickly, I wanna to get to the airlines. So as an independent instructor, obviously you have the ability to, you have to track your own students, but you also have the ability to control your own schedule and you can make twice as much money because generally students are paying a school 50 bucks an hour, the instructor's getting half and the school is keeping the other half. So I am a big advocate of doing that. So I should be able to go from the 300-ish hours I'm at to the 1500 I need in about 10, maybe 11 months. So if you add 11 months plus three months, that's 14 months to go from zero to airline pilot. So when I say that this is possible, uh, that's what I mean. Now, if you're gonna go the independent route, you gotta get insurance. And there was a number of trolls I don't know if trolls is the right word, but a number of negative Nancy's that said, you're never gonna get insured. You're not gonna be able to use all these ratings. You're a low time pilot, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Yesterday for the price of 2,900 bucks, I bought all the insurance that I need. I am now licensed to teach people single engine, multi-engine and instrument in their aircraft or in an aircraft that the school, uh, whatever schools I work with, cause I'm gonna basically partner up with a bunch of airplane owners and my students are going to rent their airplanes. So that company, in case you are curious, is called Aviation Insurance Resources. And they have a deal with safepilots.org, which I used. Um, and you can get as much as 25% off the price. There was one thing that I was missing, missing so I could only get 15% off. And I chose the maximum level of insurance for everything. And that's why it cost me 2,900 bucks. If you have uh, more questions about insurance, I'm not an insurance broker, I'm not an insurance expert, go to safepilots.org, fill out the application, they'll put you in touch with aviation insurance and you'll be all set to go. So again, the rest of this video, in case you haven't seen my other video, I just wanna explain kind of where I'm going from here. The goal for me, I'm in the SkyWest Pilot Cadet Program, which really doesn't mean a whole lot. If I was going to one of their approved schools, I would be eligible for uh, some uh, tuition reimbursements, but I didn't choose a school like that. So I wasn't eligible for those tuition reimbursements. But if you are thinking that you're going to start at a regional airline, there's a couple things to consider. One, what I like about SkyWest is they're very well known for their jet training. 
Uh, number two, they cover almost the entire US and they happen to have a base right here in the town that I live in. And as I covered in another video, in order to make this professional pilot gig as much of a part-time job as possible, you really wanna live in your base. And, and I've got other videos on the channel that, that go into that. But basically it just comes down to eliminating the commute and minimizing the pain and suffering of reserve, being on reserve and not needing a crash pad. I'd way rather be on reserve in my house than on a crash pad in Chicago, hanging out with a bunch of other pilots who are probably in their 20s. Um, that just doesn't sound like a whole lot uh, of fun to me. So make sure that um, if, if SkyWest, for example, if that's of interest to you, apply to their pilot cadet program as soon as possible because doing so allows you to build seniority versus the fellow new hires that might apply later than you. And that is going to affect your class dates. It might affect your ability to select a base and so forth. So sooner is better. There's no downside to doing it. So definitely do that. All right, we're getting close to wrapping up here. The other thing that I'm planning on doing a lot of, and I've been building my social media presence to support me in this, and I've got a website, flywithtrent.com, is I'm doing a lot of networking. This, this is my first week back since being at flight school. And I've spent a good amount of time this week networking with other plane owners and people at schools and so forth so that when i start to run my ads for students on craigslist and social media i've got a supply of aircraft for those students to be able to rent so super duper important that you hang out at the airport a lot if you're taking the approach that i'm taking and you get to know everybody i mean literally just walk around and if a hangar door is open be like hey man how are you i'm a new flight instructor new here what's going on tell me about you because everybody knows somebody that wants to learn how to fly as an example i went and had lunch with my mentor at the nampa airport yesterday not only did he introduce me to a whole slew of people one of the guys that he introduced me to was on the ramp with his 182 with his wife and his daughter and his son. And he's an airline pilot. He works for Delta, I believe. And as soon as they found out I was a flight instructor, he's like, oh, cool. I want you to teach my wife and daughter how to fly. Boom, there's my first two students. If I'm not at the airport, I'm not getting that opportunity to put my face in front of other people. All right, so a couple things before we wrap up. If you found this video really helpful, my ask for you is that you leave a comment and you click that like button, which is what a lot of people did with the first version of this video when it was my plan. And that's why the YouTube algorithm showed the video to over, it garnered over 115,000 views. I would imagine it showed it in the feed to probably a few million people because only you know 6% of them clicked on the thumbnail and watched the video. So the more engagement you guys can give me, the more of my gratitude you have, because it's not like I'm making a ton of money by pumping out these videos on YouTube, but it's really, I'm just trying to help other guys my age at this point in time, be able to realize that this is a legit opportunity to go and be a professional pilot and capitalize on this pilot shortage and the huge increase in wages. Um, and I want you to do it the right way. I don't want you to get sucked into or sold other ways that are gonna take too long or cost too much money or cost you frustration. So I'm hoping that the information in this video is wildly valuable to you and the more engagement you can give the video, the better. And if you would also like to receive notifications in your inbox of future videos, and there's going to be a lot more videos that I produce in the months and years ahead, you can go to flywithtrent.com and you can get on the email list and you're not gonna get a whole bunch of emails from me, but you are gonna get emails notifying you each time that I come up with a new video. But thank you so much for hanging out with me this long. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions in the comments. And I look forward to also seeing you in the next Fly With Trent video. Take care, have a great day, bye-bye.